Shalom, shalom. Welcome to the Native Latin and Black Lost History Show. I'm Captain Yashua. I have uh, Captain Amariah with me. Shalom. Happy Sabbath. This and our special guest, like I said on the uh, intro, the Hebrew history expert. I was going to say guru, but that I felt like, you know, that's hypocritical. Because, uh, that's like Elam stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's not a guru. What's that? He's a Hebrew history expert. Deacon Icon. Deacon Icon. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Here. Wait, wait. See, I don't have regular applause. I only got the one with the laugh. I know. It is insulting, right? <laughs> no, no, no. This one will be insulting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Welcome to the show. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we are broadcasting from uh, IUIC Las Vegas this uh, Sabbath day. Uh, all praise to the Most High in Christ for uh, allowing us to be able to come out and visit and edify the, uh, the schools. Right? Um, so, you know, I wasn't sure, like, you know, normally we talk about, like, news topics and we'll kind of, you know, give scriptural relevance to that stuff. Right. But uh, it's, it's rare that we get to have uh, uh, yourself and, you know, your, your history background with that stuff. You know, I often joke about you being the Northern Kingdom advocate and all that, but you know, you were, along with Deacon Asaf, uh, you were one of my first teachers that I would speak to, you know, on the regular. Right. Um, you know, obviously the bishops, uh, but I only saw them like on DVDs until I finally <laughs> met them. It's like meeting like a celebrity, but um, you, to me, and I mean, you notice uh, with, with the few Northern Kingdom brothers we had in the beginning, you, you were one of the brothers that were very, um, uh, important in bringing that understanding to us and, and building that up and building us up so that we can then go out and, and, and give that information. So right. in, in the process of that, you've just shown like an affinity of, of, for history. That's just one of your spiritual right. gifts, right. Um, you know, along with recall. Yeah. <laughs> you remember the most obscure Attention. things. I know brothers talk about living concordance, but it ain't got nothing on deep. So, and uh, you're always finding different books, different pieces of history. I mean, um, you know, you want to talk about destroying people with doctrines out there that uh, what we know as the northern tribes uh, today are not Israel. And the stuff you bring out just like destroys it mm -hmm. because they're not able to intelligently articulate scripturally. Like I find right. out when they say Osirath not America, but they can't tell you where Osirath is. Right. And they'll throw out things like Australia or something like that, but have nothing to reference that, nothing to back that. Nope. Right. So, it, you know, I can say whatever the hell I want. I don't mean it's true mm -hmm. unless I can validate that. Right. And, and this is where the deacon is able to, like, really kind of come in and give that sense. And listen, we don't need to go to other books to prove that stuff. But our people put a lot of credence in that stuff. For as much as many will criticize, you have the, the, those of us that run the gamut that criticize the Bible, period, and don't believe in it. You have those that will believe in only the Old Testament, and that's really because the New Testament is too hard for them, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's you don't need that stuff, but our people will will rely on that stuff. They're always going to question the scriptures, but they won't question the manual that tells them how to run the thermostat. Right. That's a book written by a man, right? Mm. Or the science book that tells them this or that or whatever it might be. All right. Um, but our people are visual. Our people are stiff-necked and rebellious, like the scripture says. And sometimes you got to hit home with these things to make that reference. And we often say. And this isn't to say this in a derogatory way to my Southern Kingdom brothers and sisters, but there is more documented history from various books outside of the scriptures mm -hmm. to prove and validate that the Northern Kingdom are Israelites than what you would find for like, you know, Judah, Benjamin and Levi. Mm -hmm. And listen, in the spirit, you wouldn't be offended in that because you understand that the conditions and historically everything that happened that, that allowed that thing to go down that way and why it needed to be that way. All right. But the reality is, I mean, I often look at it like this. If anything, it's an insult to Northern Kingdom that it has to be that way because Southern Kingdom, they don't need the history books, right? The history is ingrained in you. Northern Kingdom, the one that's hard-headed, mm -hmm. and you got to start showing them and remind them that they were slaves, right? Right. Like, no, no es clavo. Cristo no es negro. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> we were never slaves. We never, you know, Christ ain't black. Uh, but there couldn't be anything further from the truth. Um, before, So before we start maybe jumping in there, I want to do some housekeeping, all right? Call in number if you want to call in for comments or questions. It's 516-531-9797, 516-531-9797. If you want more understanding, more uh, information on your history, what uh, the Lord requires of you to obtain repentance in the faith of Christ, you can go to IsraelUnite.org. That's www.IsraelUnite.org. 
Additionally, if you want to purchase any uh, merchandise, apparel, music, books, fringes, not on the Sabbath, the site will be closed, but you can go to OriginalRoyalty.com if you want to start uh, showing out your true heritage. That's www.OriginalRoyalty.com. So uh, I'm going to pass it off to you and Cap while I post some links as I normally do, uh, spread the links around on Facebook. And uh, today's topic, you know, we were speaking last night. I saw you got this book here. Um, I, I, I called it View of the Hebrews. And we must bethink ourselves. And, and this history piece is so important. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to give a little background of, of the book uh, from some stuff I found online. So, you know, I did kind of copy and paste some of this. Some of it's my own words. I mishmashed it together uh, just to give a, a little segue for the description, right? So it says, the book of Second Ezra, the 13th chapter and the 40th through 47 verses, bears witness of the prophecy of the lost tribes and where they would be in the last days. Back then, you have to understand, and when I say back then, I'm talking about maybe, you know, three, four, five, six hundred years ago, uh, there was this understanding of the Apocrypha and the book of Second Ezra, right? And it was a different world and a different time where, where science, falsely so-called, wasn't as prevalent. And... Um, People, people based history on biblical history, as we should, even the heathen did. But now with science, I sent you, I don't know if you saw the video I sent you, Deep, about the DNA test and the two of them were too different. Yeah. The, uh, because I know we always talk about how DNA is garbage, Gosh. like for years. So this sister, this sister posts, she does a DNA test. I, I'm going to digress for a second here. The sister posts a DNA test. Uh, so she did the Ancestry.com one, right? And it comes back that she was like 97% European and like 3% uh, Jewish. Right. And she's showing pictures and she's like, yo, my family's, you know, black, you know, this, that. So she calls them up and they're like, no, it's not a mix up. It's not a mistake. It's accurate. So she goes and she orders the 23 and me one and it comes back, you know, like more like what you would think based on her physical characteristics. They said she's like 70 percent sub-Saharan African and something else or whatever. Right. So the whole gist of it was then they get this Edomite expert to come in, which everybody should now jump on board because of people who are not built up in the faith. If he saw cosigns, you're good to go. Right. <laughs> And he basically says, he's like a biologist that, that deals with that stuff with DNA. He goes, listen, these things vary, vary widely. And the part that I really caught on to, because, you know, for years we often articulate this in a different way, is that you have to think about DNA in this way. There has to be a source to compare it to, mm -hmm. right? And if they're basing the source DNA on modern day understanding expectations of who the people are in the world and the place they have today, then it's going to be wrong. You are never going to take a DNA test, you so-called blacks, Hispanics, you natives, indigenous people, and they're going to compare it to who the real Israelites are. They're going to get an Amalekite, a Khazarian from, from over there and say, this is the source <laughs> DNA. So no wonder your thing don't come up and say Jew. Like, what did you think you were going to get in that thing? The scripture says you'd be hidden ones. The scripture says your heritage would be lost. The scripture says that you won't know who you are and that you will be scattered among all nations. So you think a science DNA test is going to actually give you accurate information? No, they're basing it off of things, of a source reference, because you have to compare it to something. And this biologist said it this way. He goes, DNA tests are really good. And he didn't use the word paternity, but this is what he would say. Basically, if you want to do paternity, right? You want to know who your father, your grandfather, to make those connections. But he said, as far as what they call ethnicity, it, there's no way that it's ever going to be reliable. You're not going to be able to go ahead and say, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know, and they're going to be all right with that. And this is where I say science falsely so-called. Science becomes falsely so-called when it's contrary to the scriptures. I don't mean disregard science. Science has its place. Medicine has its place. As long as it jives with what the scripture says. If it starts to go away from that, then you have to decide what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe science or are you going to believe the Bible? And it becomes falsely so-called when it's contrary to the scriptures. So now, back to reading this here. So you have to understand, in that time, everybody used biblical history as their reference, as they should, because the Bible's a history book, not a book of fairy tales. Right. Also, there's another instance where a woman had a um, DNA test. She did three different labs. Mm -hmm. she, visited three, she visited three different labs, and she got Mandingo from one, Ashanti from another one. It was nonsense. So the guy comes on there, like you said earlier, and he goes, when you examine genetics, we have thousands to hundreds of grandparents, hundreds. So the probability is lessened because it becomes a number. It becomes a it becomes a guess guessing game. The probability is less than one percent. So you cannot say for certain. Oh, um, that's your lineage because the the, the further it can go accurately, 
is grandparents. That's why paternity tests are accurate. Right. That's what he says. The paternity is accurate. Because exactly. the grandparents is direct, and your parents is direct, and you. When you go beyond, you go to great greats and great great greats. It's, it becomes Lord of Dice, one percentile, two percentiles. It's guesswork. So you're going up with someone's guess, not someone's facts. I know science has a certain steps too, like it's observation. Um, oh, the scientific method. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. They talk about observation, that. Mm -hmm. analysis. Well, uh, first they have the hypotheses, hypothesis, then they observe. Which is a guess. Right, it's a observation. guess. Observation. Observation, analysis. They have to put controls in place to do the, uh, right. uh, the experimentation or whatever it is right. um, that they're going to do. And then they rule out variables and other stuff. And then usually what happens is they'll have to test again. Right. And they'll have to test again. And then it becomes a theory, but a theory is not a proven thing either. A theory right. is not fact. Right. A theory is not fact. So we don't, that's where you're talking about that guessing comes in. That 1%, that 2%. That's why it's hypothesis. And, um, guess too. I remember taking, I hated it. Uh, it was a statistics class, but it was statistics based on, you know, scientific research in school. And I forgot what it's called, but they have a, they, they use math. And nothing's a hundred percent. Basically, if it falls within a range of a certain number, so I'm I'm gonna I'm butchering what it really is because I fell asleep through a lot of it, but I did retain some of it. Um, and uh, let's just say it there has to be for them. Let's say the marker is not. I'm not saying this is what it is. It has to be ninety three percent or better for them to say that it's fact. But they won't put the part that there's a seven percent chance that it's inaccurate right. either. So, you know, so it's like, uh, they call it strongly something, weakly something or whatever, and then that's how they figure that nonsense out. But the point is, and, and you know, for me, I almost say that and I start this that way because you will have people you know, call in and talk about, we've had people call in on the show and talk about DNA mm -hmm. and all this other stuff, and it's like, be quiet. Like, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 only, the only ancestry .com that we need is in the scriptures. It says that your spirit bears witness with, with this spirit. Uh, right. right. That's, that's, right. That's, that's all we need. It, that's exactly to be able right. To identify with the curses and the prophecies and everything else. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. And at the end of the day, that's really that's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, the identifying with the curses. I mean, the scripture tells you they're there for a sign, for mm -hmm. a wonder. And, you know, th that that um, second Ezra in, in the Apocrypha bridges the gap of how these people got over here, mm -hmm. because everybody always wondered how did how does this, you know, they have the excuse me, they have the Bering Strait theory. See, like yeah, right. people, people can't come to me with like this whole academia stuff. You, you, first of all, you don't impress me with all of that. And secondly, I, I, I've done things in school on this. I did a paper on the Bering Strait theory and how there's science out there mm -hmm. that actually disproves it. Yeah. But because it's a sacred cow, they, they, they go on record and tell you this. For as much as science is anti-religion, they are very dogmatic, all right, about what they hold to be true. Right. And a sacred cow is one of those things that it's kind of only there because it's just been there so long and they won't let go of it, right? But it holds no weight anymore, right? So it's kind of like um, another term for sacred cow would be like an old wives' tale, mm -hmm. right? Which means it's something not true, or the Bible will say a Jewish fable, mm -hmm. right? Something's not true. Folklore. So yeah, folklore, things like that. So the sacred cow is the Bering Strait theory, right? And scientists try to present new theories. And when we went to Puerto Rico and we interviewed the professor there, who, who's an anthropologist, mm -hmm. scientist, uh, he was showing us the stones. The Hebrew, the, 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 yeah, the, um, the artifacts that they found with the Hebrew writings on them and stuff. And he says, uh, I've had people off the record tell me that this writing is Hebrew. And by connection that the people in Puerto Rico then at one time were 100 percent Hebrew before before the mixing. He says, but they won't go on record because they call it pseudoscience. And because they are so dogmatic about the older things that they have, we have it. I don't know if it made the cut on the video we put out, but he goes on record and says this much. He goes, I can't name them. He goes, I've tried to get this validated to say that it is Hebrew and that the origins of these things are Hebrew. He goes, but these linguists, right, uh, paleo linguists or whatever they call it, he goes, they will not go on record and say it because they'll become, they'll lose credibility in their field if they do that mm -hmm. because of the things that are, that are held to so dogmatically. Mm -hmm. So dog dogma deals with religion, mm -hmm. which means they deal with science as their religion, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, religion isn't uh, necessarily mutually exclusive to the Bible, right. is the point that I want to make. Science is the God, and the science is the Bible. Right, right, right. Um, politics is religion for some people, right. right? And it tells you that in First Maccabees, when he says uh, they all consented to his religion, where he said they should all be one people and everything. Democracy. That was politics. That's democracy. Democracy is a religion, all right? 
Science is a religion. It's its own religion. I don't mean Scientology. I mean science is itself. So now let me come full circle and let you and let you jump in here and start and start uh, popping in on this. So it says, uh, so the book, The View of the Hebrews by Ethan Smith, suggested that Native Americans, I like the little clever words they use, suggested. Mm -hmm. Not proved, not validated, yes. suggested. Suggested that Native Americans were descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. This theory was held by many theologians and laymen of his day who tried to fit new populations into what they understood of biblical history. That's another crafty thing, because he puts the theologians and then laymen to let you know that, you know, hey, it was proffered up by people that had no degrees and stuff like that. Um, of his day who tried to fit new populations to what they understood of biblical history. So he's trying to tell you that they were trying to make the Bible fit these people, not that it did, that they tried. But the stuff that comes out of here is heavy. He says, which they felt encompassed the world, which is true. Biblical history encompasses the world. It talks about every major empire, even this one. Just, it, it says you're, you're thinking that it's going to call it by its current name, but it's not. Um, these tribes were believed to have disappeared after being taken captive by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC. Right. So um, I'm going to go ahead, post my link, share this stuff out. I'll let you kind of pop in and say what you want to say. I know I said a mouthful. All right. Well, shut up. Uh, shalom. <laughs> shalom, Israel. Uh, shalom, guests who are listening. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, mysticism that revolves around Native Americans. You know, who had the drums in the background, make them like a mystical, magical people, like unicorns, you know? <laughs> You know, that's what they do. They try to make Native Americans some kind of mystical, magical people that you know that are that are that are filled with uh, mystery and and and, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, just non fantasy and so forth, because they want to kind of uh, separate them from Negroes and so forth, which are the same people. Um, one of the things I, I'll bring out if I get the book. Well, I do it the way I don't have on me now, but one of the things that I learned in history was that um. Native Americans were classified as Negroes at one point in time. You had so there's Native Americans on this side of the world where it had different physiologies, different features, but they all had those different features in, on different parts of the, of the Americas. So you would have one that looked more so somewhat of a Asian, like you know, slanted eyes, high cheekbones, but still had the dark skin, and you had with finer hair. You had some amongst them with uh, woolly hair, wide nose, the Negroid features, but they will all share these different physiologies throughout the, throughout the island. So it wasn't just like you had some looking foreign on one part, and then you had some looking black in this area. They all had those different mixtures amongst them throughout all the Americas, North, South, and Central Americas. So that was, a, so it was acknowledged in this book that they all had a common ancestry. They were all from one person, all from one lineage, and they all spoke the same language. It wasn't like, oh, he speaks Chinese over here, which is another lie. They were not Asians at all. There's no record of them being Asian of any kind at all. They don't speak the language. They didn't keep the customs of Asians. So that's another lie. They came from what? Uh, the Barren Strait. Because it, it was believed that the Barren Strait was, a, was there was a, a, a ice bridge that formed when they were able to cross over into the Americas that was formed 40,000 years ago. Then they said, okay, that doesn't seem to make any sense. 30,000 years ago. Okay, that doesn't make any sense either. 20,000 years ago, that didn't make any sense either. 10,000, it became, you know what? No, it's a theory, we don't know. It's just, and it was a land bridge that formed during the glacial era. Glacial era is, is another another term we have now for ice age. So they're trying to make it sense as if the Native Americans, some, some kind of Neanderthals that just walked across this freezing, blistering, 100 degrees below zero temperatures. Like I said, ancient North faces back then, they were able to walk. <laughs> Uh, across this freezing temperatures, I don't know. I don't know how that, I don't know how that works, but um, that nonsense came about. So that there's also it was dismissed. It was nonsense. Um, but what did make sense was you had um a man named Jose. Now it makes sense, but it didn't make sense. A man by the name of Jose de Acosta. Jose de Acosta was a Jesuit priest that visited the Americas and encountered the Native Americans. Now during this time, the science back then had to be Bible based. The white man understood that science, any kind of science of the world, God made everything, so we're going to use science, we're going to use science to determine and, and prove that there's a God. But of course, the white man being the devil that he is, the deceiver that he is, had to find a way to go against that grain. So Jose de Acosta was called a naturalist, where a naturalist is basically another way of saying that you believe more so in nature, that you believe in a creation more so than a creator. He's basically an atheist. So what he did, well, he goes, well, 
based upon the horses I'm seeing, the horses here, and the grass, it's like Asian grass. These are Asian horses. So, yeah, the Americans are Asians. And that's the Baron Strait theory was born. He started that nonsense. It was him. Then you had another man named Garcia. And Garcia came and said, well, I'm going to use wisdom and I'm going to speak to the Americans themselves and ask them where they come from. Well, they were told, they told me that their forefather was Issachar when I was in Yucatan Peninsula. They said that their forefather was Issachar, Mexican. So they're Israelites. So the, you had, a, 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 in Spain, you had a, a bit of a division. You had Garcians versus the Acostans. But the Acostans were minor. Were minor. The Garcians were the majority because he, he spoke to them. So people said, well, we kind of lean more towards Garcia. Garcia makes sense because a lot of other people who were over there are talking about the Acostans over there. Um, Hernan Cortez over there, and they all said that they all came from the east by ships, and they're, 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 they're Israelites. So William Penn was over there, a man named um, Lord Montesinos went over there. Um, uh, Manasseh ben Israel wrote a book about it, and he went over there. He did he, he gathered research. A man by the name of uh, excuse me, a man named um, Lord Kingsborough. He went into debtor's prison because he spent all of his money com um, compiling all the evidence that proved that the Native Americans were Israelites. In Mexico, North America, South Vietnam, he wrote an eight-volume book. Eight-volume. The book is now located in the Vatican, in the Smithsonian. The book is worth 60 grand. You can get it if you're going to have $60,000. I had the PDF. Yeah, I messed up with the internet. Shouldn't have made, shouldn't have made that. <laughs> so I got the whole eight volumes. Um, I haven't, I haven't used that yet. That, that's going to be a nuclear bomb for another day. I'm kind of holding back on that one. I left that alone. Put that to the side for you uh, native, native haters out there. Um, you black only is rights out there. Um, so I'm going to just dive into it. No talking. I'm going to go to, um, first and foremost, the, 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 the how I put it. I'll go back to my original point. A lot of the Native Americans who who retained their Negroid features were reclassified as Negroes, mm -hmm. and their land was taken from them and was given to white folks. And they classified a lot of the Negroes or Native Americans as Negroes. So a lot of a lot of us say, "Oh, the guys are mystical, magical people," but a lot of so-called African Americans are not really African Americans. A lot of them is guys or Reubenites. They just don't know it. So when we think that we're not reaching. Northern Kingdom, we actually are reaching them because a lot of them look like a Judah because they retain no features. Now, the ones that we, that the white man puts on TV propaganda, he puts up the, the foreign looking ones, the ones that don't look too much like, like Judah. They put up the other ones that look different from us, which are the same people. Well, they do that in like the novellas too. Right. And a lot of those people in the novellas aren't even Israel. Yeah, a lot of them are they're, Spanish. They're like, uh, not even Spanish. Some of them are German or and Arabic. they speak Spanish yeah. or Arabic. Yeah. And they put them in there because it fits the um, the standard of beauty right. that's current in the world today. So some of the most popular, famous novella stars, that's the Spanish soap operas, are actually not even from the countries that these things film and broadcast from. They're, they're Europeans. Right, it fits the Blancamiento. Uh, Blancamiento, I think. Blanca yeah, Blancamiento, see. Sí. A certain, uh, 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 agenda, basically the white, mm -hmm. the the purifying, the, the better of the race. And that was something they white. did from when uh, the Spaniards and Portuguese were here. They created this caste system. They had classifications for every mixture. Right, uh, mestizo. mestizo. Right. Uh, there was one that means the return. I had spoke to you about yeah. it. I have the slide somewhere. I can't look yeah, it up. But like it talks about like uh, so they kept track of all that stuff. Where so like if you know if a if a if a field dark skin field worker mixed with a Portuguese they would this and and they knew it was by the father like that that was the thing that was heavy with right. the naming of it. So you became what the father was, and then they they would like show you how I forgot how but like how they, there was one that they would call the return and it's basically when somebody whose father was uh, uh, Israel and maybe the maybe the mother wasn't. Uh, then goes and has uh, uh, relations and, and gives birth to another one, then it says now that becomes the return again. So, like, basically it was, like, two Jakes. Uh, one, was, one was maybe Jake by the father, obviously, half, like, Spaniard, uh, and then he gives with, like, a full Jake. They say, okay, that's the return, meaning now right. you're back to the potential right. to keep the line. You're turning back again. to the lineage, right. Mm -hmm. Still fight again. Wow. So, it, right, you got to find that stuff. You got to find it. I have it. It's in here. It's in my file somewhere. I got to look So, 
Um, again, I'm going to go into the scriptures real quick. I'm going to go to uh, Jeremiah 12 and 7. Just to clarify that as well. Because the, doc, the, the, the agenda is more so if you don't fit particular features, then you're not Israel. Okay? And which is a nonsense. I'm going to Jeremiah 12 and 7. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 7. 9. Verse 9. Nope, I'm sorry. The yeah, 7 is good. Verse 7. I have forsaken mine house. I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of the of her enemies. Keep that word. Keep that in mind. Dearly beloved of my soul. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. The dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Go ahead. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It cried out against me. Thus being rebellious, he warred against the Lord, against his laws. Go ahead. Therefore have I hated it. I hated him for it. You are rebellious, I hated you for it. Yeah, so out of my hatred for you, I gave you to the hand of your enemies. Go ahead, watch this. My inheritance, my inheritance is this people. Go ahead. Is unto me as a speckled bird. So after he scattered us among our nations, we became a speckled bird. the end result. We became a speckled bird. Go ahead. The birds round about are against our you. enemies. Go ahead. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field. Come to devour. You can destroy her. Got, um, scatter her apart. So the point one. To do it, there's the speckled part. Speckled, the word speckled is synonymous to the word um, uh, variegated. Those of you who are in the, the Hebrew, blue letter, the word for speckled would be variegated. Variegated means multicolored or polychromatic, meaning you range in a variety of colors. Speckled, speckled means different colors, different specks. You have one bird of one particular color, but on that bird is different spots. So it'll be a brown bird, but it'll have spots of white here, spots of red here, spots of green light, and so forth. So it was a multi, it's a, a bird of one color, but it had different colors on it. So Israel was particularly, we are still a dark race of people, but within that dark race, you have different speckles of different colors. You have yellow jake, tan jake. We, we call them red bones, high yellow, I call them waffle skin. Waffle skin, skittle skin, whatever. <laughs> It's all the same Negro to me, regardless of how they look. But you have tan, you have the brightest from Captain Yahshua to Captain Abiel, to Captain Amariah, to Captain Hananiah. It's, it's different ranges of shades, different shades. You understand? So Israel would be a multi, we're not, we're not monochromatic, meaning we're not one shade, right. and then we stay that different. Like, like white folks are monochromatic. White folks look huh, okay to that. Well, back then they back then we all were, we all were. <laughs> monochromatic. But over time, us being scattered, we took upon ourselves the features of the nations that we scattered amongst us. Israel had a habit of mingling for hundreds of years. So you cannot go off of, oh, well, you're not dark enough, so therefore you're not Israel. You have white folks that look like Negroes. Mayor de Blasio's son has wider nose than me, thicker lips than mine, a big afro, dark skin, all of that. He is not a black man. That's a white man. Bob Marley is a white man. I can go on this for days. You have a variety of people who can pass. You have heathens that pass the Jakes. So if you have heathens passing the Jake, you're going to have Jakes passing for heathens. It's common sense. Ashley from Fresh Prince. It's not Jake. That's a Persian girl. Hillary from Fresh Prince. Is that a black woman? That's a Welsh woman. Y'all watch these shows. Well, I suppose the sisters, they're not. They're not our people. It look like us, but they're not. Esther passed for a Persian woman. So why would a person not pass for a Jake? It's, look, again, this is a, a, a Afrocentric vibe, pro-black type thing going on with sisters. A lot of sisters who are behind it, who have a, a hatred for sisters who have finer hair than them or a lighter skin than them. They thought the brothers lean more towards those features. And so therefore they go, yeah, see, they're heathens. They're not our people. Because they, they don't have my woolly hair or my wide nose or my dark skin, so they, they're heathens. You can't you can only be with me. No, you can't do that. That's not scriptural. We mix around with the Romans. We mix around with the Greeks. We mix around with the Portuguese. We mix around with the Dutch. You have Afro Germans. We mix around. We went to World War with World War Two. You had Vietnam. We messed around with the Vietnamese women over there. We messed around with the Germans in World War One and Two. After you have Afro Germans, they call them um they call them uh the brown baby somebody like they call them brown they, they, oh and what happened was a lot of the children that were fathered by black men and white and German or Aryan mothers that came out looking more like the mother they would give them up to adoption 
to white families. So a lot of these these uh white children are not a lot of them is, a lot of them, a lot of them are Afro German. The black fathers and Aryan mothers. So we can't just say, oh, because he's a certain feature, he ain't Jacob's madness. But I'm gonna get into it. So Jeremiah 12 and 7 tells you that Israel will be multicolored people. Okay? Now, give me Ezra real quick, second Ezra. Because a lot of Hispanics, uh, I said, oh, I'm going full circle. A lot of Hispanics, we they range in features, hair texture, color, um, nose, whatever. Their features are different. They vary. They're variegated, multi-featured people. Even so-called blacks are multi-featured people. So second Ezra is now 13. No, 40. The book of Second Ezra is chapter 13 and verse 40. Now, the thought the doctrine is that Ashraf is not the Americas. Ashraf is South Africa. That's a doctrine, which is, which is hilarious because there were Hamites in South Africa. So how do I got that from? But we're going to read to find out, we're going to read, read to prove that it's not South Africa. Read verse 40. Those of the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king. This is, a, this is 722 BC, Shamanazar the fifth, I believe. The fifth. Go ahead. This oh. is also in reference to 2 Kings chapter 17. Go ahead. Whom Shamanazar, the king of Assyria, led away captive. Shamanazar the fifth um, led Israel, ten tribes of Israel, but you have to include Dan. Let him away captive into Assyria, 722 BC. Now, this right here was a major plummeting or fall of Northern Kingdom at this point. Because the 12 tribes of Israel had beef, the nine, nine went their way, or ten went their way, if you include Dan, and then and, 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 uh, two, and you know, Levi went along. So I'll just say nine. Nine went their way, three went their way. Okay, at this point, they divided. So Judah resided in the south, Southern Kingdom, Ephraim resided in the north. Northern Kingdom. So the ten or nine tribes here were overthrown and conquered by the Assyrians. Okay, go ahead. And he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. Go ahead. So they got bought in slave ships. They were carried over the waters, over the waters into Assyria. It wasn't just a walk. It was like they traveled by, across, the, across the seas. Go ahead. But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen. They would leave because they were placed in heathen borders. So the Assyrian policy was, was as follows. When you examine America, so Captain Yasha mentioned earlier how America is in the Bible, it is. America is, in fact, a, a combination of every captivity Israel has under, underwent in one. America adopted Egypt to itself, Assyria to itself, Babylon to itself, Persia to itself, Greece and Rome to itself. Okay, what do I mean by that? Egypt had the slaves build what? The most powerful capitals. The U.S. Capitol, not Egypt, but the U.S. Capitol, we built that. We built the White House. We built the all monuments, all the monolithic, the megalithic monuments and so forth in Egypt, the Valley of Kings. The flourishing of the kingdom itself was placed upon slave labor in Egypt. Our slave labor in Egypt, us. So Israel has that, I'm sorry, Egypt has that in common with America. America used slave labor of Native and Negro, Native American and Negro, Black Americans, to build up this country. Then you have, the, in the back of the dollar bill, you have the all-seeing eye, the pyramid. So America worships and adores Egypt, even here in Vegas. They got pyramids and all these different Egyptian um, pictures and, and arts and so forth. Okay? Even the way the president sits down. I think Lincoln sitting down is the same way Pharaoh sat down in the statue in Egypt. So America worships Egypt. And America used God's people to build it and make it a major empire as it is done now. It's just because in comparison, you go, you fast forward to Assyria. Assyria had a policy where whenever they uh, capture a people, they would, they would, they would, what they would do was they would say, okay, now we have them captive. We're going to take them out their land. We're going to make them walk from one place to the next or whatever, ship them over, whatever, and place them in this land and put heathens and put our people in their land. They would lose their sense of identity and they would assimilate into our kingdom and all become one people. Sound familiar? You had a thing over here on this side of the world called the Trail of Tears, where the Native Americans leave their places of land and put whites there and made them go to Oklahoma, from, I think from Florida to Oklahoma. Chill tears. So nothing new. And the assimilation, again, nothing new. 
Then you had Babylon, did the same thing, took us out of our land, gave us foreign names, and put us in their land, put heathens in our land. Same thing. Then you had the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire had a had a um religion where they all melting pot. Everyone can everyone can worship, they want to worship, you can worship your God. We, we had liberal, we were liberal. It was li liberalism, liberalism <laughs> was basically right. instituted in Persia. So America adopted that also. You have liberals, you have conservatives, same thing, democracy, same thing. And you have democracy, came out of Greece. Now, democracy was born in Athens, Greece. So then the Greeks and Romans said, okay, we're going to take the Greek philosophy and merge it into our own. That's how America's called the Republic. The Romans are a Republic first, then an empire. How to become an empire? Through Israelites conquest. They conquered Hannibal, took his wealth from him, made an empire. Always us. So we all we, we are literally the reason why the empires rise into power. So nothing new under the sun. So you have um uh Greece and Rome merge into one, the Roman Empire, and America is an extension of the Greco Roman Empire. It's an extension. Latin in the back of the dollar bill. You have the same people. America is the extension of Rome. You have Spain and so forth. It's all the same things, all the same people. And the same people are enslaved in the same land. So America is basically an, an amalgamated kingdom of every empire we've been in until from the past until now. That's the miry that's clay. why it's the worst. That's, a, that's why in Daniel we tell us about the statue, the miry clay. Miry clay, together. right. Yeah, all mixed it's, together. It's all mingled. It's all mingled. It's all mingled. It's a, we live in an amalgamated kingdom. That's why it says, into a public for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberalism, Persia, and justice for all white people. I mean, all people, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's about no niggas. Hey, can I, can, I, yeah. can I read a scripture? Yeah. I, I bring this out a lot when we do the show, and uh, it needs to be in people's remembrance. Um, so at First Maccabees 141, because right. I mentioned it earlier, and it's basically what you're saying. Right. And and it really, it's not like it necessarily started with the Greeks, but the Greeks kind of perfected it, and everybody ran with it. Right. Under the Romans, and then uh, through the different empires, the right. modern day empires up until today. Mm -hmm. Right. The Book of First Maccabees, chapter one, verse forty-one. Because the deacon made a statement that the empires rise and all that other stuff because of us. Mm -hmm. And they put these things in place because of us too, mm -hmm. all right? And and that's going to tell you why, because it tells you the reason why they pushed this doctrine, mm -hmm. right? Go ahead, read. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. That's America. Mm -hmm. That's all the different empires that he was mentioning, the Persian and everything. Hey, we all going to be one people. Mm -hmm. The Persian Empire, they'll tell you historically, was so effective and covered so much land because their method wasn't that they wanted to come in like the Assyrians and then take you out and put their people there. They said, no, you can stay here. And if anybody remembers the, the movie 300, he said, all you got to do is pledge water and this yeah. and fealty to Earth us. And water. Earth, Earth and water. water. Saying, this is our land. We can roll here. This is our territory. And y'all can still stay in power. You mm -hmm. can keep your seats. Mm -hmm. You can still roll this way. But you're just going to say that you're Persian territory. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna follow. And you don't even gotta follow all of our stuff. We might like some of the rules that you got. This is how you got this amalgamated thing. We might like some of the rules and things you got. Mm -hmm. You can keep that, and y'all be the top rulers here. But as long as you acknowledge that I'm the top top. Yep. And that's how it went down. And if you remember 300, that's what he told him. He goes, "Listen, you, you could be you could be the warlord of Greece, mm -hmm. the Spartans." He tried to tempt them with that. You don't got to be subject to these. Because remember, he couldn't do what he needed to do and deploy the armies mm -hmm. because they had those three nasty mystics and whatever mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Right? Listen, the movie was uh, clearly fantasized to a great extent to create a visual effect. But if you're watching that stuff and you understand historically what's going on, there's elements of true history and all those things. Hollywood knows the truth. Mm -hmm. They don't do these movies just willy-nilly without any type of research. Yep. Right? So it's the same type of thing where we're all going to be one people. Read. And everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agree according to the commandment of the king. So it says all the heathen agree. The heathen were always down with that right away. Okay. Right. Opportunist. Okay. This guy's the ruling power. I'm going to. That's why he came at him and said, yo, you could be the warlord of Greece. He tried to sell him a dream. And he said, okay, go ahead. But read on. Yay. Many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. Not all Israel was done by bitter constraint. Many also consented and they said, hey, that sounds good. I'm going to roll with that. Kind of like what you see today. 
Oh, and I'm, uh, look at Kanye with Trump. <laughs> he all confused though, because he married to the Persian anyway. So he married to the heathen. Anybody that, any Jake that gets with any of Kardashians lose their damn mind. They, 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 go, out. It's my menu. they go, bro, they go nuts. They go nuts. Read. And sacrifice unto idols and profane the Sabbath. Read. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land. And forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days, and pollute the sanctuary and holy people. And that was the goal. Their goal was to pollute the sanctuary and the holy people, to pollute us. Right? That reminds me of Micah 2 and 10, where it says, This is not your rest because this place is polluted. It's, it, it, it's all connected there. Bishop Kana always says the Bible's very redundant. And it needs to be because our people are hard-headed and stiff-necked and rebellious. And you're going to see the same themes of same elements everywhere. The place is polluted. This thing is polluted. Their goal was to pollute us. Read. Set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice right. swine's flesh and unclean beasts. Read. That they should go also, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised. Because worst case, right, if you couldn't tell by complexion and everything else, you knew a Jew was a Jew. The man children, why? Because they were circumcised. He said, yo, I don't even want you doing that. Why? That was crafty counsel. I'm going to make y'all hit it. You're not going to have any markers that show that you are people. I'm going to take your heritage. You're going to leave that behind. You're going to leave your customs behind. Anything that identifies you as the children, the chosen children of the Most High, he goes, that stuff is going to be taken away from you, and you're going to consent to that thing. Go ahead, read. And make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation. Go ahead. To what end? This was the reason for it. To the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. They wanted us to forget the law and change all the ordinances. To put us in the state of mind today. To put us where we are and all led perfectly up to today. Mm -hmm. And guess what he says? Read verse 50. Because this part's important. I said some did consent, right? Out of, out of just their lust. Mm -hmm. But then others, what did he do here? And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. So it was upon pain of death. Those are the ones that did it upon bitter constraint. So many just agreed, mm -hmm. and then there were those that did it upon pain of death. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's not fallacy. And if you notice, this is the part where I bring out, if you read, I think it was verse 41 or 42, he says, they all consented to his religion, to the king's religion. religion yeah. Democracy is religion. Mm -hmm. So you got people who walk around saying, I'm atheist, I don't have a religion. But they're, but they're but they're democratic. They're, yeah, they're democratic. Their religion, their religion is is and, and their idols are these political leaders that they set up. Mm -hmm. You know, look at what I mean. Who knows? It's all you know. It's all so fishy. The shit they do. Part part of my language. But with the um with the guy that sent the bombs to these people, mm -hmm. and I didn't say he was a Trump support. Who knows if that's legit or not? But the point is, if it is, Trump's his idol. He mm -hmm. did it because his guy was saying that, right? Mm -hmm. And Trump can say there and say, "Well, I never said don't don't do this or don't do that." Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why I love Trump, though. Like, because the most I put him there, you know, he's, 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 and he's honest, man. And he's honest. He's honest. I appreciate, just like Richard Spencer. I love Richard Spencer. Love oh, yeah. You don't know who Richard Spencer, Spencer, the white supremacist dude? Yeah, I, I love Richard Spencer because he keeps it real. Yeah. He'll tell you to the face. And I laugh because all our Jake that love Esau, that put Esau on a pedestal, when they hear Trump speak, when they hear Spencer speak, I know that they cut to the bone. Mm -hmm. They're like, but why, Master? Why? Mm -hmm. Don't say those things. Yep. You saw Barkley and the other dude. Yeah, they, yeah, was, they was like, <laughs> he, yo, said, he said, I don't know what you're saying. It sounds so faggy. He said, it sounds so faggy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, went, they were like, we want what you want. He goes, that's good. But y'all should have that with just your people. Mm -hmm. And, and I have that with my people. Right, and that's biblical. And they mad at him for that. I love it. I love it. That's just hey, I, I found those slides. Oh, you found, oh no, you found it. I found them. Oh, I know. I know. Get I this first. Uh, Second is 13, verse 41. But they took this counsel among themselves. So after you were taken captive into Assyria by Shaman after the king, that, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen. And they were given liberty under the Persian regime. Because remember, Persia was liberal. If you want to return to your land, because like, God moved King Cyrus' spirit after the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied King Cyrus 150 years before him by name. Isaiah 45, he mentioned Cyrus by name. 150 years prior to his existence, this guy's gonna be used as the heathens to give us liber to give us freedom to rebuild Jerusalem again. So we knew from the time of Isaiah 
that Jews on the fall. Okay, we knew that. So I so King Cyrus gave us liberty to do that. So during this time, this, this the verses are giving a time skip. So in verse 41, they took counsel among themselves. That's when Persia came along and said, okay, you guys can do what you want, return to your land or stay where you are. It's up to you. So they decided among the 10 tribes and nine tribes among themselves said, okay, now we are free to return to our land. What are we going to do? Watch this. And go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. Stop there. Where never mankind dwelt. We're going to go to a further country where never mankind dwelt. These 10 tribes are going to a country where never, never mankind dwelt. Mankind was in Africa for hundreds of years. How do I know this? This is, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to help, help you out. I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up. When you read Genesis chapter 10, it mentions what is called the table of nations. You read about Japheth going to, you have Javan, that's Greece, you have Kittim, that's Italy, you have uh, Togama, that's France or Gaul, whatever, right? That's Europe. Javan took Europe. That's ancient history, it's common knowledge. Javan took Javan's Greece, Kittim is Italy, these are Japheth's children. Um, Ashkenaz is Germany, uh, Sephard, Sephard uh, is Spain, whatever. This is common knowledge. Japheth took Europe. So mankind dwelt there, right? You go to Shem. Shem inhabited part of Africa further into the east. That's Semitic lands, right? Then you had Ham inhabited Africa and part of the middle, part of the so-called east, right? So mankind resided in Africa. What place is not mentioned in Genesis? North America. America is not mentioned in Genesis at all. If it is, what's the name? Give me the, give me the name. Which, did Noah have a baby mama still on the side? <laughs> have a son that had this side of the world that's not mentioned? Because she was a side chick, so he didn't mention that one? No, he did not. It's not mentioned because there's a place where never mankind dwelt. And the man visited here? Yes. He came here, he would come here and gather, gather materials, wood or whatever, spices. That was done. But they, they didn't stay here. They didn't make this their residence. Where mankind never dwelt. Noah's three sons who were punished to Europe took Africa, took Europe, and took the East over. There was no son of Noah's that took America over. So that was a place that mankind never dwelt. So I was referred to as the New World. Because it was new to man. It was un unsettled land. Uninhabited. Go ahead. That they might keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. Read 41 again, 41 again. Verse 41. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. Go ahead. That they would keep their statutes. That they might there. That they might there keep their statutes. That they might there in that land where never mankind dwelt. Do what? Keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. The, the, the reason why... Assyria was able to conquer Ephraim because they weren't keeping the laws in their own land. So the Lord said, fine, you won't keep the laws in your own land? Keep it, up, keep it in the heathen land then. And so Israel said, okay, we're going to do right this time by the Lord. We're going to go, we're going to leave these Assyrian um, settlements that we're living in now, and we're gonna, or Babylonian settlements at that time, for Babylon. We're going to leave these lands we were placed in and go somewhere else and start over fresh. That was the intent when they first arrived here. Okay, we don't. And they entered into Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river. So when you examine the places where the Assyrians placed them, it was along the coast, along the lines of the Assyrian river, of Euphrates River, okay? So they ended up hopping on board on ships and sailed through that river, and they ended up in, they ended up in the Persian Gulf or Indian Ocean, where, in which they sailed in, which is a very turbulent oceans, very dangerously turbulent oceans. They, they went into the Indian Ocean or Persian Gulf, whatever, and sailed around... Under Africa, made stops from shore, around Africa, and went forward. And ended up hitting what? South, and they did drop on south, and they went to central, and north. Some, some sailed upwards, some walked upwards. There was a different, different constant migrations over the course of the years on this side of the world. And history documents that. Go ahead. For the Most High then showed signs for them. So when they were on their way, to this side of the world, unsettled territory in New World, the Lord that showed them signs they were going the right direction or signs they were going the wrong direction. It was a long, long trip. Go ahead. 
and held still the flood. And held still the flood is the ocean, because I said earlier, it was turbulent seas, turbulence, very, very uh, dangerous. So the Lord had to keep the, the seas calm and settle so they can survive the voyage. Go ahead. And held still the flood till they were passed over. Until they were able to pass over the waters, pass over the sea, not walk over, pass over on a boat. Go ahead. For through that country, there For was. Through that country, around that country, go ahead. There was a great way to go. Go ahead. Namely, of a year and a half. There's a book, a movie that, well, there's a movie that came out called um, Columbus, Conquest of Paradise. And he, he mentions that it would take about from Spain to America at least a year. So you go around Africa, that's an extra half. Okay? And then, and then, then when you watch the movie itself, he has the earth cut in half. As if it, 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 the thought was that if they go too far, they fall off the earth. It was flat. That was a Babylonian nun's doctrine that Esau borrowed. It said the earth is flat. And so they said, we go too far, we'll fall off. Oh, we'll fall off. Columbus said, nah, man, that's a lie. Ezra says, or Ezra says that there's land over there. Because Columbus was heavily, heavily addicted to the Bible, especially in 2nd Ezra or 4th Ezra, whichever you want to call it. It's the same thing. And it wasn't just him. They said all, all remember the stuff we read before, it said that all the theologians of yes. that time, they used 2nd Ezra. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was their thing. Remember, 2nd Ezra uh, uh, stopped being published in the Bible around the 1700s. Yeah. So the conquest was already well on the way mm -hmm. by the time that they started taking that stuff out. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And the same region is called Arsur. In the same region, another mankind dwelt is called Arsur, means another land. Okay, another land, another, another part of the world. Go ahead. Then dwelt they there until the latter time. And they would dwell there until the last days. They would dwell there until the latter time. Go ahead. And now when they shall begin to come. So I want. So Arsur is referring to the Americas. Columbus identified America with Arsenal. That's in the Jewish encyclopedia, okay? And many other historians substantiate this. I'm gonna bring the evidence out now because you use that site to go, oh, that's a faulty site because that website, you go to that site, it doesn't cite the source that states that he said it's America. So that's fine. I just use other people's accounts. I have his account also, but I don't have it on me at the moment. So this book is called View of the Hebrews, uh, or the tribes of Israel in America, view of the Hebrews, or the tribes of America, tribes of America in the Amer of Israel in America, by Ethan Smith. Now, when you read the beginning, a lot of people who are Mormons, the Mormons, they subscribe to that. They go that the Native Americans were Israelites. They knew that, and so he, this author of this book, he supports Mormonism. However, he cites sources from people who are around. Before Mormonism, okay, he's just citing the, he's just citing the, the, the accounts given by other people that were around hundreds of years before Joseph Smith was even in existence, all right? And so I'm going to read some accounts here from people who actually spoke to the Native Americans on this side of the world, and we're going to read what they said. I'm not going to bring all the good stuff. I'm doing something for the elders. The elders going to pick some stuff out of this book. So I'm going to start off with uh, page... 99. Now, he cites a man named uh, Adair. James Adair wrote a book called Lost Tribes and Promised Lands because the Lord promised that we were going to come to the side of the world and dwell into the latter days by Moses in Deuteronomy 33. We're going to get that. Get that now, matter of fact. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 17. To further conclude that the 10 tribes, or 9, you include that came to this side of the world whenever mankind dwelt. That this is, in fact, our story. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 17. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. I'm sorry, go. I'm out on this one. Verse 16. Give me 16. And for the precious thing of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph. Joseph, go ahead. And upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Joseph. So Joseph is in reference, is in, ah, is in reference to two sons, um, Ephraim and Manasseh. So when you read Joseph, is referring to Ephraim and Manasseh. You know. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. Uh-huh, his strength. Go ahead. And his horns are like the horns of unicorns. His power is powerful, powerful nation. Go ahead. 
with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. With them, Joseph, the Themis, Ephraim, and Manasseh. With them, these sons, he would do what with Israel? Push the people together to the ends of the earth. He would use these sons of Joseph to push the people together to the ends of the earth. What end of the earth? This end. The western hemisphere end. All right? Read on. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. And they, that's the them he's referring to, is the ten thousands of who? Of Ephraim. That's the lead, the ten thousand. Go ahead. And they are the thousands of Manasseh. Manasseh would be under the thousands. Ephraim was greater than Manasseh. You know, Manasseh was older. So Ephraim and Manasseh were the ones that were essentially used to guide the voyage to bring Israel to this end of the earth, which would be Asher. They're the ones responsible for saying we shall take counsel and lead there and go somewhere else, this side of the world. That was Ethan Manasseh's doing. Now, there's a book, once again, by Ethan Smith called View of the Hebrews or the Tribes of Israel in America. Okay? This is a photo mechanical reprint of the 1825 edition. Okay, it's a reprint of an 1800 book. Now we're gonna I'm gonna read uh what I want to read from. Page 99. What I want? I don't want that. Page one. No, I don't want that. Hold on, that's my page. Hold on a second. That's my page. That's my page. Right. So, hey, watch what I'm finding now as I start talking. So, <laughs> it's sad, sad. That's all I need to do. <laughs> okay, page 48. <laughs> You're a problem, brother. Page 48. I'm going to read. Uh, Yeah, 48. This is Tigla, Tigla, Tigla Tolnezer. Tigla Tolnezer was the grandfather of King Shamanazer we read about earlier in Ezra. Tigla Tolnezer or Tigla Tolnezer or Paul for short was the grandfather of Shamanazer. He was the first one to overthrow Northern Kingdom and take. It was done in waves. It wasn't just one fell swoop grabbing the feet from Northern Kingdom. He, it was waves of them. Tigla take, take a first wave. You had uh, Tigla Tolnezer take them to Assyria first. And Shamanazer came and did the same thing. Then Sargon came and grabbed the rest of them. It was in waves. So it says, Tiglath Tolnezer, king of Assyria, captured the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh who lay east of Jordan and placed them in Hala, Hala, Obar, by the river Gozen, which is also towards the Euphrates River. Uh, First Chronicles 5.26. About 20 years after, 134, 134 years before the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, and 725 years before Christ, 725 years before Christ, the rest of the ten tribes continued, continued, continuing and pent and penitent. Shamanazer, the succeeding king of the ten, uh, I'm sorry, the succeeding king of Assyria attacked Samaria, that was Ephraim's capital, took the remainder of the ten tribes in the reign of Hosea, king of Israel, that's in Sagazras, carried them to Assyria and placed them with their brethren in Hala. Habor by the river Gozen in Media, 2 Kings 17. This final expulsion of Israel from the promised land was about 943 years after they came out of Egypt. The king of Assyria placed, it placed in their stead. In Samaria, people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hama, and Sepharvaiah. It was one of the, it was here was the origin of the mongrel Samaritans, meaning false Samaritans that resided there. This is page 49. I'm going to page 100. Page 100. Page, one, page 99. The Peruvians have been spoken of as paying adoration to the sun. The Peruvians, that would be uh, near Brazil. And as receiving their race of, and as receiving their race of Incas, because Peruvians are Incas, the Inca Empire, as children of the sun, they call themselves, in their succession of 12 monarchies. They had 12 monarchies. The Indians have had, have had much of an apprehension that their one great spirit had a great affinity to fire. They bought that from um, the Bible. It says, our Lord is a consuming fire. So they said, oh, hey, if he's a consuming fire, he must reside where? In the sun. That's what Israel start to do. You start to take the Bible and paganism and merge them together, as we're going to read. 
And the Peruvians, it seems, went so far as to embody him in the sun. I mean, he lives there. Here seems a shred of mixture in the per of the Persian idolatry with the theocracy of Israel, as the more ancient Israelites call a degree of the idolatrous distemper of Egypt, as appears in their golden calf. So the ten tribes, the time they resided in Media, and before they set off for America, may have blended some idea of fire with their one God. So they took the Assyrian and Medo-Persian doctrines and came over here and merged together. You see that? So it says they resided in Media and came off to where is now America. So <laughs> again, it's 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 common sense here. I'll read another one. It says, Doctor. I want I want that one yet. Mm, not yet at all. So, I do that. Thank you. I'll find something else. <laughs> I so, um, I had found the, uh, I, I, I'm not set up to show it on the uh, screen, I had found, but just to give you like how thorough they were in, in pulling this stuff up, um, I, I, I kind of got to sort through it a little more because I got to give definitions of what the names mean, but they had like a classification for everything, right? So, I'm looking at one here, and they have drawings, so they had the pictures of it. This is the part where I can't show you, but... Um, so I was talking about these slides earlier. It says, so if you had a Spaniard and an Indian, you would then call them mestizo. Mestizo, right? Right. Mestizo, right. Uh, and they got some pictures of how they of how they wound up looking. So going into the shades, I'm gonna do a follow up show on this when when uh, you know be great if Deacon was here, but uh, you know we'll do it on our show like on a on another time, um, so that I can figure out a way to like show the images on the Facebook Live. And then it says when you get a Spaniard and mestiza. So now he's telling you the father Spaniard, and the mother is uh, Spaniard also Spaniard. Spaniard by right, but mixed. Mm -hmm. Then you get a castizo, a castizo, right? And then it shows you the images of it, right? Mm -hmm. If you get Spaniard and black, you are a mulatto. The castizo is Castilian and uh, mestizo, Mexican. Uh -huh. Castizo. Yep. And then from Spaniard and black, you get a mulatto. Mm -hmm. All right. And it has a picture here of a. Uh, Dark, dark guy dressed like a Spaniard. Mm -hmm. Right, so you see him here, right? And he walking there with a with a a, a white Spanish woman, right? Mm -hmm. You got pictures here of that, different things. There, they had a real black here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you get a Spaniard and a mulatto, it's a morisco, which means more. Mm -hmm. It means a more. So they were telling you, um, the darkness that you would get. And then if you get a Spaniard again. With a morisca, then you get an albino because they wound up coming out light. White, 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 yeah. Right? And if you, this is why I want to do it. I got to prepare it so that I can break down why they did it this way because it starts going into like, you know, how the complexion started changing and the appearance. And then from a Spaniard and an albino, this is the one, I forgot what the rename was called, but it means a return backwards. So it's a return backwards white to a Spaniard, to white. white going back to white. So when you get a Spaniard and an albino, you want a woman. So they like trace the, the, the lineage that way. And this, uh, this is called castas, which is just the caste system that they right. had there. And that's what black folks are making now in Israel. They're making the caste system. I, and and yeah. a certain darkness right. in Israel. Right. Right. Yeah, and it's the Willie Lynch thing, yep. like the caste system. Mm -hmm. uh, from Spaniard and return backwards, uh, hold yourself in midair. Uh, I forgot what the name is, but that's what it means. A hold yourself in midair, right? Um, and it just goes on and on. They have albarazados and Indians. You get a barcino from hold yourself in midair, mulato. You get an albarazado, and it tells you the diff. And what's what's crazy about this is the 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 way the complexions look. And then you know you're there, and you're starting to say, okay, well, what's look? They have Zambaiga. Uh, from an Indian and someone black, you got a wolf. They called it. Dark. Yep. So if you got a native and and someone dark, you were called a wolf. Wow. From an Indian and a mestizo, you were a coyote. <laughs> From wolf and black, a chino. Well, chino. That's the, that's the chino. Uh huh. 
from Chino and Indian or Cambujo. Bro, it, it, it's like a whole bunch. Of, I got to break it down and like really um, make the connection so you can see why it's so important. But um, anyway, call in number 516-531-9797. 516-531-9797. Um, we still got about 20 minutes left on the show. Yeah, it's time, right? You thought you just were going to go through? <laughs> yeah, fun, <laughs> hey, yeah, there's a brother posted about the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. Yeah, we, we were going to talk about that, man, but it was Esau killing Esau, so it really uh, is. Yeah. Right, so, <laughs> so you know, we just said, all right. I know we normally do the news article stuff, uh, but, you know, we got, like I said, the history expert here. So uh, it's critical to take advantage of those um, <laughs> gifts that, you know, the leadership has to bring that stuff out. Um, yeah, another brother post about the books, uh, Dogs of God, is about the Dominicans. Yeah, because Dominican yeah. means loyal dog of God, yes. right? So, like, yeah, Dominicanus. I mean, like, canines, so it means dog. But I like the way dogs sound better. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Dominicanus is, like, Latin for canine, like loyal canines. Of, is dog, dog. Yeah. Um, and you know, you think about all the names today. I, someone was saying something last night. What about saying something about Mexicans? That 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 when that when the when uh, the conquistadors came, like he oh, said yeah, something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 uh they could have pronounced the word um, Azteca, so then they start calling them uh, Mexicas. <laughs> Mexicas. And that's where the that's word Mexican comes from. So it, it's all uh, derivative of Mexico. Right. And, and, but you know, and but a lot of it is made of BS. So like you know. Um, you know, they say Tainos were the Puerto Ricans and those from that, but they never called themselves Tainos. Tainos no. was just a word they no, used. Greeting. It was a greeting. Mm -hmm. And they just called them Tainos. You know, uh, historically, you look them up, they, they were called Arawaks. Mm -hmm. Right? So you look up the Arawaks and the Caribs. The Caribs was like uh, Levi and uh, uh, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And then the Arawaks was what you would call Dominicans, Puerto Ricans today. Um, and they all did trade with each other and all that stuff. That's what they, but they had their own names. You know, the islands had their own names. Before it was Hispaniola, it was uh, Quisqueya, yeah. yeah. all right? Um, as far as the Dominican Republic. Puerto Rico was called Borinquen, all right? Um, they all had their own names for stuff, but you know, Iso being Iso, they came over and they went ahead and renamed things. They renamed them, they renamed their stuff. And, um, you know, one of the things that always stands out to me is when Columbus talks about how he brought how many Hebrew translators was it? He had a man named Luis de Torres was one. Mm -hmm. He was the most famous one. And you had a number of them because that was during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. Many of the Jews were being persecuted and were forced out of Spain. And mm -hmm. so they had the option of either being sold into slavery or killed and tortured into Christianity or go on a voyage with Columbus and avoid being tortured and killed and enslaved. So he chose to come on a ship with him mm -hmm. and be his translators. And a lot of them remained here and had families here. It was the Torres being one of them. He had a, they gave him wives, he had children, all of that on the side of the world before they took over and began to kill them all. And, you know, people say he came, you know, they, they're still, my daughter brought home, like, uh, they gave a little coloring book about uh, Columbus. And, you know, it didn't go too detailed. And says, as a matter of fact, I had some pictures because I was going to share it with y'all. But they still try to perpetrate the... Um, the lie that he was looking for the East Indies. Yeah, so just pushing that nonsense. Right, so, so that's, says, that, that's that sacred, sacred cow. Um, cat, right. 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 So, yeah, it's the sacred yeah. cow, right? So Columbus Day, right, so it says he wanted to find a fast way to get to Asia. And then it shows the, uh, he sailed to the Americas in October of 1492. Well, you see how they start setting up the kids? First of all, it wasn't called the Americas, all right? So he wasn't sailing to the Americas. Not. He was sailing to Arsareth. If you want to get it real historically accurate, they'll say he was sailing to Arsareth because that's when you look at the movie 1492, right? The Congress mm -hmm. of Paradise. Mm -hmm. He tells you, he recommends, you know, he gives like some historical reference like of why he thinks there's something past the Canary Islands, but then he says Ezra's. And well, that's when the guy, like the priest was like, Ezra's. He was like, oh, you're going to go based off of the Jew. Ezra's was a Jew. So was Christ. Right. So was Christ. Right. So it shows the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, right? Um, and then it says, Christopher Columbus found a new way to get from the old world to the new world. And in that, they speak true. That's their name drop for Arsenal when they call it the new, new world. world. Right. Because they knew it was the place where never mankind had well, dwelt until our people had went there. Mm -hmm. 
So they said, damn, we're going to pop over there and check this thing out. They referred to it as Manifest Destiny. Right. It was destiny to overthrow and kill these people. That's exactly what they do. That, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I want to mention, uh, uh, what what's the movie? Uh, the, the, the series that I was talking about? I'm drawing a blank right now. Where they, they talk about Manifest Destiny. Into the West. Into the okay, West. Yeah. Um, so Into the West is a uh it's like you know a docudrama that they put on on one of those networks but it's really good i bought the dvds because uh they focus a lot on gat and uh and ruben and they talk about um how esau the so-called settlers here right they came the conquerors really but they say settlers see how they get you man with the words they, they indoctrinate you with this stuff settlers sounds a lot nicer than conquerors right mm -hmm. No, they were fleeing something and they just wanted to settle here, you know? Isn't that nice, you know, to be neighborly, right? No, not when you're killing everybody and taking all the land. And it's interesting because what I, what, what I like a lot, I mean, there's a lot of little nuanced things in there. You know, um, they show at the beginning, because it goes through time periods of when uh, they started coming over, it shows the map. And um, you, you can look up these maps, and it shows the map of when Gad was here. And when you look at the map of, of this side of the world when, when, when um, our people were uh, in rulership here, you see it all broken out by, like, the intertribal stuff. And, everything. you know, there wasn't no New York, New Mexico, Las Vegas, none of that stuff. And as the years went by and these people were on this manifest destiny, and the show's really good at following the lives of these people, um, showing how they got pushed into the West. So, you know, because they came, they landed in the East Coast, they did the 13 colonies and all that, and then they started pushing West, further West, further West, further West. And as they did that, though, they wound up ravaging everything, the land, the people, all right? And it shows you how they started to push what they called the Indian nations into reservations or other territories. So before they were reservations, they were territories, and they started to call them territories. And they would push them into different territories. And you see their land getting smaller and smaller and the states popping up, the name of the states popping up. So I just think it creates like such a heavy graphic when you look at it spiritually. And at the end, towards the end, like it shows you the trail of tears and all that. At the very end, all that was left was Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So they had pushed all the indigenous that were left here, that weren't killed, that weren't uh, put into slavery and died in slavery because yes gad was in slavery i got books on that right i just talk about it so hard for me with the books but on the indian slave trade which nobody talks about there was an indian slave trade mm -hmm. all right um and i often say like the big theme with the indian slave trade is they didn't like them as slaves because while they were hardy and they knew the land it's, it's because they knew the land that they didn't like them because they were confident to escape and they had this fighting spirit in them where they were like okay and that was the issue with them is that Gad kept fighting back. The difference was when you brought, you know, uh, I'm not even gonna just say Judah because we know that there's, there was other tribes in that remnant that came over from um, the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you brought Jake over here, they didn't know the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. And it was this, it was just, and then, and then you think about it psychologically, how they were caught, how they were taken, the conditions on the ship, everything when they got here, they were broken. Mm -hmm. You wanna talk about broken spirits? You wanna talk about putting somebody in, in a very primal state? And, um, they stayed, a lot of them, because if they would escape, they'd get eaten by alligators, hunted down and shot. They didn't know the lay of the land. Gad didn't make very good servants because they knew the lay of the land, so they would use it to their advantage. I, I spoke about this, uh, I think, a few weeks back. I forgot where we were. But when we talk, when you look at the movie Apocalypto, that brother was able to deal with the other ones that were all into the idolatry because he knew the land and the, he used the land to his advantage. That's how it was with Gad. So when you read the books on the Indian slave trade, and it talks about it. First of all, they were in the fields together, all right, with Southern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom was in the fields together. It was just in less numbers because at that point they had killed off a lot of them. They had rather died. Some of them were jumping off the ships because they knew what was waiting for them. they rather just kill them so jumping off the ships. They said, I'll take little passage. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But they say it was so bad as they were moving people because a lot of times they were taking them from different islands to different parts and whatever that they didn't need to navigate. They followed the trail of dead bodies floating in the ocean to get to the next spot. Isaiah 22 and verse 18. To conclude how they brought us over here. Isaiah 22 verse 18. The book of Isaiah chapter 22 verse 18. 17. Verse 17. 
Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. Right, so all of us will be in that one place. Cover us all, cover all 12. Go ahead. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. He'll toss thee like a ball to a large country. Both of y'all, go ahead. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. Watch this, verse 19. And I will drive thee from, from thy station. In your position, go ahead. And from thy state he shall pull thee down. It will be broken. I'll pull you down, you'll be broken. Now I'm going to read what we saw on this side of the world. Page 160, it says, The Chickasaws came from the west, he says. The world, the world is to be burned or turned upside down. It is generally thought it will be burned. A certain description of persons infamously wicked will be burned with it. Read it again. A certain description of persons infamously wicked will be burned with it. What could that be? They will roll in fire, yet cannot die. There are to be other signs before the end of the world, such as great shaking of the earth. This old Indian adds, adds, but aside from that statement, it has been said by old Indians that before that event should take place, the burning of the world, the Indians and whites would mix so that the tribes would be confused and lost and not know what nation they formerly belonged. So it was prophesied by the elders, the old Indians, that we were going to mix the white folks and lose our identity also. It was common. They knew that already. They knew this already. All right? I'm going to read another one. I mentioned earlier about how white folks destroy each other. We don't care. I'm going to read that. This is page 99. This is Mr. Up there, who spent, he spent, I think, 40 years with the Indians. Maybe how much? 40 days, 40 years, whatever. In this, in, in this interview, or his interview with them, is that the Indians have but one God, the great Yohewa, Yohewa, whom they call the great, beneficent, supreme, and holy spirit, who dwells above the clouds, who dwells with good people, and is the only object of, object of worship. So different are they from all the idolatrous heathen upon the earth. He assures that they hold this great divine spirit as the immediate head of their community, which, opi with the, which opinion he conceives they must have derived from the ancient theocracy in Israel. He is sure that, they, that the Indians are intoxicated with religious pride and call all other people the accursed people and have time out of mind been accustomed to hold them in great contempt. So we didn't care about the other nations. We never did. Page 149 says it again. <coughs> Page 149 says, you heathen lovers out there. Page 149. They said, under the third argument, he says, agreeably to the theocracy of divine government of Israel, the Indians think the deity to be the immediate head of their, of their state. All the nations of Indians are exceedingly intoxicated with its pride and have, an, and have an inexpressible contempt of the white people. They used to call us in their war orations the accursed people. So we never liked the other nations. On this side of the world, or on the other side, we didn't like them. Especially so called white people. I'm going to read uh, page 201. It says, alluding to the high places in ancient Israel, God denounced Amos 7, verse 9, the high places of Israel shall be desolate. In Jeremiah 12 and 7, I have forsaken my house. But earlier, I have forsaken my house, I have left my heritage, I have given them the beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. It then follows, verse 12, the spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the, of the land to the other end of the land, no flesh shall have peace. When this was written, the ten tribes have been gone from Canaan many years. God had indeed given us this branch, given this branch of the beloved of his soul into the hand of our enemies, as verse 7 just recited. The subsequent verse given may be far better understood in future days. Should greater light drawn on the subject, the present, our natives as the tribes of Israel. They and we, in that case, shall be better understand the passage. The spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness, for the sword shall devour from one end of the land to the other land. This seems an event then future. The sword shall come, though the tribes have, been, have before been banished, this, as is related to Israel, 
seems to be an event to be accomplished during their outcast state on this side of the world. So the white man understood the prophecy regarding Judah and Israel being chased and devoured by the sword on one side of the world, on the other side of the world. It says the third verse after this is predicted their restoration to their heritage in their own land. No, su no supposable origin assigned to the American natives could, go could so well account for what we find of the American high places as the supposition of their descent from ancient Israel. All right, so proving that they're Israel again. I'm just skimming through. I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm skimming through. It says here, the writer of archaeology says it was page 205. The writer of archaeology says it was the posterity of, of, of this saint whom the unhappy Montezuma, the most noted and venerable Mexican chief when the Spaniards had first arrived in Mexico, thought he recognized in the soldiers of Cortes, the Spanish general. We know, we know by our books, this chief said to Montezuma in his first interview with the Spanish general, that myself and those who inhabit this country are not natives but strangers who came from a great distance. We know also that the chief who led our ancestors hither, Ipun, returned for a certain time to his primitive country. We have always believed that his descendants would one day come to take our possession of this country since you arrived from that region where the sun rises and, we, and, you, and as you assure me, you have long known us. So again, he's saying and making it known that our forefathers came over here by way of ships and that their forefathers told them that, okay? So Montezuma understood they came over here from the east, all right? I'm um, trying to find where it mentions them, their complexions. And they were all brown. Right, son? We got six, six minutes on the broadcast. Six minutes on the broadcast. Um, no, you know, I mean, it's a lot to bring out. I was reading something else because you mentioned some things, and I, and I thought of, like, uh, the Hopis, the Hopi Indians, talking yeah. about their mythology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to read, uh, let me see. Hold on, hold on. I don't want that. I want to read real quick this part here. Um, well, they talk about the sun spirit, and like you said, how they <laughs> went and they twisted, they perverted, that it says, you know, our Lord is a, a flaming fire. Mm -hmm. Um but it says, Hopi legend tells that the current earth is the fourth world to be inhabited by Tawa's creations. Now, if you, if you, if you hear this in the spirit, you're going to you're gonna understand that this isn't all mythology. This is, they took what they knew, having been Hebrew, what we read in the beginning with Second Ezra's, and in the process of time, it became something else because of the idolatrous spirit that they had. Mm -hmm. It says, the story states that in each previous world, the people, though originally happy, became disobedient and if contrary to Tawa's plan. Tawa, Yawa. Whatever you want to say, right. it sounds the same. And what? He said they were happy, but then they became disobedient and lived contrary to his plans. They engaged in sexual promiscuity, fought one another, and would not live in harmony. The most obedient were delivered to the next higher world with physical changes occurring both in the people, in the course of their journey, and in the environment of the next world. If you're looking at it spiritually, you understand what's being said here, all right? It says, in some stories, the former world was then destroyed along with their wicked inhabitants, whereas in others, the good people were simply led away from the chaos which had been created by their actions. That's the prophecies in the scripture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like real clear. It says, uh, two main versions exist as to the Hopi's emergence into the present fourth world, the more prevalent. <coughs> See, they get all crazy. There's a spider grandmother. She caused a hollow reed of bamboo to come into the sky. So this is where they started losing their minds, right? Yeah, in Africa, we called the spider god Nancy. Right. Uh, that was, uh, we did that also on the West Coast. We started worshiping spider gods also. Named right. Nancy, a storyteller. Right, right. Uh, Anansi. 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 Right. Um, and he was a spider. He was the embodiment of a spider. And that was like an ancient, um, a lot of the slaves that came over initially, that was the god that they, they worshiped for a while. Anansi. Anansi. Mm -hmm. Um, so it says they have another version that the third world was destroyed by Tawa in a great flood. Wow. Uh, before the destruction, Spider Grandmother sealed the more righteous people into hollow reeds, which were used as boats. So you ever play telephone in school? I mean, maybe, maybe new younger generations don't play that no more, but you used to play telephone, right? 
and you would start at one end of the class, and by the time you got to the end, it wasn't the original message, right? Everybody's laughing when you find out what the original message was. And that's like maybe 20 kids, 30 kids that it went through. I use that example to say, as this stuff was told, right? A lot of it wasn't necessarily always written and passed along. The vein of the original message is still there to some degree, but it gets changed a little bit, right? So like if I said, Yahweh destroyed the world with a flood, if by the end it gets to that it's tower destroyed the world with a flood, the point that I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to lead you in a direction to see it, but there's too much information out there that if you studied in the scriptures, it'll be easy as you read it to make the connection. I knew about the Hopi a long time ago and all the other different tribes, but I didn't understand my, my heritage and my history according to the Bible. So you read it and you read it as the, oh, look how fanciful the spider goddess and this, that, and the other, and, you know, the tower and the flood, I would have never made the connection of what's going on there. I was telling y'all last night, I got another book, The Aztecs, mm -hmm. and the first few pages talks about, they say, hey, yeah, we're not from here. Our forefather came, uh, our forefather led us out of uh, a great captivity on the other side of the world, and uh, he did many miracles, and he parted waters, and uh, we wound up migrating here, mm -hmm. and we're descended from them. That's in here, too. Right? So, all the similarities, so you get the different... Um, and, and, and when I say tribes, now I'm talking about the different names they give themselves. So you have the different carnal tribes, and you have all these different similarities of a history that when you understand our real history in the Bible, it's not so far-fetched to look at that and, and say, hey, this sounds like it's talking about what the Scripture's talking about. You know, I just read, they said, hey, there's going to be a changing, and uh, we went into this because, you know, the, the, the wicked... Uh, we were wicked and what have you. When it talks about third, fourth, fifth world, it's talking about the different rulerships and empires, right? We lost, listen, like in Acts 1 where he says, will you now restore the kingdom again to our people, right? right? Meaning, listen, there was a time when we were happy. We got disobedient. Other people came into power. Um, there's just, I mean, I know we're talking about in the car over here. It, it, you could do a, a, a four or five hour class every week mm -hmm. uh, on just all the history. And for Mexico, real quick, this is page 204 it says, this surely affords an argument in favor of the idea that the occupants of those high places in Mexico originated from Israel, mm -hmm. where all their high places were for sacred worship. So they built <coughs> their high places in Mexico the way they had it in Israel. So the white man understood that. Right. And also, this is page 178, it says, the Indians of New Spain, that's Mexico, I believe, uh -huh. bear a general resemblance to those who inhabit Canada, Florida, Peru, and Brazil. They have the same swarthy and copper color, flat and smooth hair, small beards, long eyes, the corner directed upwards, that's the jinky eyes, and permanent cheekbones. So they all had the same exact features, okay? Well, hey. these areas visited here, but you go in the North America and so forth, they had Negro as well. But that went over their head. Because it said they have beards. Yeah, small beards. <laughs> Nobody heard that part. See, so that's why I got read. They said they have small beards. And then they said that they shaved. And what did they show you? They showed them. They showed them when uh, it's shaved. You go to a museum. They show them saved. We got twenty seven seconds on the show. I know it's a lot of stuff. Yeah, so, 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 I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you, I need you like on every on every week. Right. Anyway, uh, that's the Native Latin and Black Lost History Show. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I say, uh, like, share, support. All right. Um, the power of social media. And sharing these things uh, goes a long way in spreading the message, all right? This is just another form that we can do it. Uh, so with that, we say shalom. 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 Uh, uh, go. Israel is back. We back. We Israel back. is back. We got back. the nations running scared because Israel is back. All uh, lies on us because we keeping them lost. Keeping them when the lost. Lord will return, Babylon will fall. Precept solid. solid. We got them on lock. Got them. God's chosen people with Christ as our rock. Israel is back. We back. Israel is back. We back. You heathen get you ready for our whip to crack. Damn. We used to scream black power while Haram was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission, minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. 
Nicaragua, Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.